All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for our Dementia 360 series featuring thought leaders reporting from the front lines of dementia. Um, Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia touch hundreds of millions of lives from the people living with the condition and their loved ones to professional caregivers and healthcare teams. Our goal over the next two weeks is to provide you with a comprehensive perspective on the most up-to-date research, caregiver support, prevention tips, and more. So no matter how you're impacted by dementia, you will walk away with tools that will be helpful to yourself or someone you're caring for. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hara. Dr. Hara, welcome. Thank you for join it, joining us today. I will let you take it away from here. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to um, be part of this Dementia 360 event. Um, my name is Yuko Hara. Um, I have a PhD in neuroscience. I'm the director of the Aging and Alzheimer's Prevention Program at the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. Um, and today um, I will talk about making smarter brain health choices um, and also introduce to you cognitivevitality.org. So um, the topics that I will cover today um, include um, the most important part of this talk is the seven steps to protect your cognitive vitality. Um, then I will talk about the cognitivevitality.org, which is a free um, evidence-based resource for brain health. Then um, I will give some examples of um, different food, drinks, um, and supplements that we've evaluated for brain health. And then I will end with some take home messages. Um, so let's start um, with, so the seven steps to, to protect your cognitive vitality. Step one is to eat a healthy diet for your brain. So the Mediterranean diet um, has received the most amount of attention in terms of brain health, as well as cardiovascular health. Um, it also has the most amount of data. The Mediterranean diet is inspired by the dietary habits of Greece, Southern Italy, and Spain. Um, it is rich in um, olive oil, omega-3 fatty acids, and fish, and nuts, and lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, in a randomized controlled trial um, showed that the Mediterranean diet promoted cognitive function in older adults who were at risk of um, cardiovascular disease. And there are some epidemiological studies that also suggest that long-term um, benefits of cognitive health can be seen in people who adhere to the Mediterranean diet. And this includes reduced risks of Alzheimer's disease as well as cognitive impairment. So um, there are lots of different diets out there, um, but generally, you know, a healthy diet is good for the brain. And characteristics shared by brain healthy diets include high amounts of vegetables and fruits, um, eating fish, um, legumes, and also um, avoiding sweets, processed foods, and um, red meat may also be protective. Um, so the second step um, for um, your cognitive vitality is to get enough sleep. Um, impaired sleep uh, contributes to cognitive decline and may increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease by up to 55%. Um, studies have also shown that 15% of Alzheimer's disease cases may be attributa attributable to sleep problems. Um, during sleep is when toxic proteins in the brain get flushed out of the brain. Um, it is also during sleep that important memories are being consolidated. So um, the advice here is to um, aim to get seven to eight hours of sleep per night by establishing a bedtime routine, uh, maintaining a regular sleep schedule, um, and if you have um, sleep disorders such as insomnia or um, sleep apnea to address those issues. 
Um, sleeping under six hours per night or over nine hours per night have been associated with um, higher risk for dementia. So eight, seven to eight hours is really the, the recommended amount of time. Um, it's also um, recommended that you don't eat or exercise right before you go to bed. Um, you may also want to avoid caffeine, caffeinated drinks later in the day, um, and also blue light emitting electronics like your laptop, computer, iPad, smartphones. Um, blue light can also um, interfere with your, um, your ability to, to have um, quality sleep. And so, you know, there are settings on, you know, most devices where you can control the blue light. Um, such that it stops, um, you know, producing the blue light um, after a certain hour. So um, the third step for cognitive vitality, and I think this is one of the most important steps that you can take for your brain health. Um, you know, we all know that exercise is really good for you. It's not just good for your brain, it's also good for your overall health. Um, so I, you know, it's probably no surprise that it's good for the brain, um, but the evidence is really striking. Um, Exercisers are up to 28% less likely to develop dementia and 45% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, exercise is also supposed to cut cognitive decline by more than a third. Um, and exercise is really good for different reasons. Um, exercise can reduce your risk of falls and injuries. Exercise can reduce your risk of age-related diseases like cardiovascular disease and metabolic diseases. Cardiovascular diseases and metabolic diseases are risk factors for dementia. So by reducing those um, health risks, you are um, protecting your brain. Um, and also exercise um, reduces inflammation and inflammation is also not good for the brain. So um, it's good in that way too. And finally, um, exercise increases the levels of a protein um, that's good for brain cells called BDNF. Uh, so the WHO um, recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week along with two or more days of muscle training activities. Um, and if that seems to be too much, um, you know, any exercise is better than no exercise. And I think um, the, the advice here is to take up something that you enjoy so that you can continue long-term. Um, examples of aerobic exercise can, you know, include brisk walking, swimming, jogging, tennis, and so on. And for muscle training activities, the most common ones are weight training, um, and some people also practice yoga. So the fourth step is to alleviate stress. Um, stress, uh, especially prolonged stress, um, can harm your brain um, and lead to disturbed sleep and memory problems. Um, stress um, can make a brain region called the hippocampus. Um, the hippocampus is a brain region important for memory more vulnerable to injury um, and stress can also increase inflammation in the brain, which I said earlier is not good for the brain. So um, everyone is going to be a little bit different and how they can best um, relieve stress, but um, common ways include, you know, taking a break, talking to your friends, talking to your family, um, taking care of yourself by, you know, eating well, you know, eating healthy, exercising and getting enough sleep are um, uh, helpful. And, you know, taking on your hobbies, you know, spending time doing things that you enjoy can also be helpful. And in addition, um, for some people, pets can be good stress relievers. Um, but of course, you know, some people may not be able to have pets in their apartment or in their building. Um, I've also read that, you know, watching short clips, video clips of, you know, puppies and kittens can also be stress relieving. The fifth step is to be social and um, loneliness and depression can impair cognitive health and cause memory issues. Um, these issues can be more common in people of older ages, um, and especially during these COVID times or during the pandemic. Um, some tips um, include participating in group activities, 
such as teaching, mentoring, volunteering, or social activism. And these days, um, there are many activities that you can join online remotely if you're concerned about getting together in person. Also, importantly, um, if you do suffer from depression, anxiety, or grief, um, it is important to seek help. Um, both the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, as well as the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance offer resources to help manage depression or anxiety. The sixth step for cognitive vitality is to keep learning and lifetime intellectual enrichment is associated with higher cognitive function in older adults. Um, there was a randomized controlled trial, a clinical trial from 2016 that showed that playing a type of brain training game reduced the risk of developing dementia by up to 29%. Um, though I should note here that not all brain games are created equal and some brain game manufacturers are being sued for making unsubstantiated claims. In this specific study, um, they used a game that trained a speed of processing, um, which is a function that um, is, you know, so the game um, was designed to improve the speed and accuracy of a person's visual attention. Um, and I also want to add here, there was also an epidemiological study that reported that lifelong bilingualism um, may delay dementia onset. So um, tips here include um, stimulating and challenging your brain throughout life and um, taking a new class or learning new things. And these are, you know, these days there's so many um, classes available online that you can take for free. The last step um, for your cognitive vitality is to manage chronic illnesses. And Dr. Philip mentioned in the earlier talk, but um, uh, so um, diabetes is a, um, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And um, you know, the statistics are a little bit shocking in that people with diabetes have up to a 73% increased risk of dementia and a twofold higher risk of um, vascular dementia, which is another form of dementia and also hypertension, high blood pressure in middle age is also associated with um, higher risk of vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But um, if you do have hypertension or diabetes, um, so for hypertension, there are several studies showing that people who manage their blood pressure, um, keeping it under control can reduce their risk of dementia by 9%. Um, so with both diabetes and hypertension, I'm going to loop, loop back to some of the um, earlier steps I mentioned, but managing your health, your overall health, um, especially if you have diabetes or hypertension with a healthy diet like the Mediterranean diet, exercising enough, you know, 150 minutes per week um, as recommended by the WHO is a good idea. And of course, when these lifestyle sort of changes don't work, then you will likely be prescribed medications to help control these conditions. So now um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about brain health news. And I wanna first start off with some headlines of science news. Maple syrup isn't just delicious, it could also cure Alzheimer's disease. Does marijuana hold the cure for Alzheimer's disease? Blueberries may help prevent Alzheimer's, researchers say. And this one's kind of the funniest to me. Even just smelling wine could help prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. Omega-3 fatty acids, the essential nutrient your brain needs more of. And omega-3 supplements don't improve memory. So how do you make sense of all of the literature and all of the media articles? They're kind of contradicting one another. Um, it's really confusing. 
And there is also um, the issue of pseudomedicine, what we call pseudomedicine, that markets dietary supplements as benefiting brain health or preventing dementia. And um, many people fall prey to advertisement that is not backed by valid scientific evidence because supplement manufacturers often use uh, subjective testimonies to promote their products as um, improving brain health. And subjective testimonies are not strong, valid scientific evidence. So these are the reasons why we created cognitivevitality.org, which is a program of the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization. Um, the contents of this website are created by neuroscientists on staff at the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, including myself. Um, but they are written for non-scientists such that it is available and accessible to everyone um, it, and it is free. Um, we post um, ratings of supplements, vitamins, foods, and some commonly prescribed drugs. These are also written by the neuroscientists, but they are overseen by an external clinical advisory board consisting of geriatricians, neurologists, internal medicine specialists, and epidemiologists. Um, so for ratings of each food, drink, supplement, or commonly prescribed drug, we review the available research. And I wanna spend a little bit of time here because there are different levels of evidence and they're not all created equal. Um, we kind of consider this list of evidence as the evidence pyramid. Um, I'm gonna start with a randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard in biomedical research. Um, it is designed to um, test a hypothesis and prove cause and effect. In a randomized control trial, people are randomly selected to receive either treatment or a placebo control. Um, but the, it, it is the gold standard. However, there are some drawbacks to randomized control trials in that they are often very, very expensive. They, um, are also limited in how many people can be recruited in this, this study, so they can often be too small of a study. And um, they can also be too short in duration um, to test things like um, dementia prevention, because uh, dementia takes a very long time to develop. Um, and randomized control trials can also be unethical. Um, for example, we can't test the effects of cigarette smoking in this kind of study by assigning one group of people to smoke real cigarettes and then another group to smoke placebo cigarettes. So um, we can't always run randomized controlled trials. So there are different types of evidence that um, we seek. Um, at the top of the evidence, um, Pyramid is the meta-analyses or systematic reviews. And these are analyses of analyses. So they are at the highest level of evidence because they compile the results from multiple studies, such as multiple randomized controlled trials and evaluate whether or not there is an effect with greater statistical power and certainty. So these studies have more conclusive results than a result from a single randomized controlled trial. Um, observational studies or epidemiological studies are really powerful for tracking large numbers of people for long periods of time. They can identify traits and lifestyle factors that are associated with disease versus health. Um, but the um, downside is that they can't prove cause and effect the way randomized control trials can because observational studies don't have a placebo control. And finally, at the bottom of the evidence are preclinical studies or laboratory studies, in vivo and in vitro testing, like those in animal models or in test tubes and cell cultures. These are really very important for exploring mechanisms and rationale for treatments. They are also critically important for developing better treatments. However, the major drawback is that drugs that work in mice or cell cultures 
um, often fail to work in people. And a good example of this in our field is that 99.6% of treatments that cured Alzheimer's pathology in mice have failed to treat Alzheimer's in human patients. So just because something works well in animal models doesn't mean that they will work well in humans. So after going through the scientific literature, we translate the research into ratings. And these rating pages, I have two snapshots here, one of the blueberries and one for genistein, which is a soy, um, soy product, um, soy isoflavone or you know, antioxidant. Um, what we do is for each food, drink, supplement, or commonly prescribed medication that we've looked into, we first rate how strong the evidence is. You know, are there meta-analyses, are there randomized control trials, or is the evidence limited to studies and subcultures? Um, then we also look at potential benefit for cognitive health. Does the supplement or food um, Will, will it likely improve your cognitive health long-term? Are, are the effects potentially large or is the effect gonna be negligible or potentially even negative, you know, like harmful? Um, and most importantly, we also rate the safety of every product um, because, you know, just because something looks promising, um, you know, you, you may not want to ingest it if it's really harmful for your, your body. Um, safety is rated based on the reported side effects in clinical trials or in observational studies, as well as known drug interactions. Um, so while I'm, I'm talking about cognitive vitality, I want to um, also talk about the blog that we have online. Um, the, the blog is also, um, the blog posts are also written by our neuroscientists on staff. And we discuss important brain health and dementia prevention findings, including those from the WHO, the AARP, Lancet, and others. Um, for example, on the left is a blog post from September 2020, which discusses the 12 risk factors identified by the Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention, and Care that when fully addressed may delay or prevent up to 40% of dementia cases. And on the right um, is the, um, the one from August, 2019, the WHO evaluated seven different dementia prevention strategies, such as exercise, diet, and cognitive interventions. And of course, we have blog posts on research findings on diet, exercise, sleep, yoga, meditation, music, and all sorts of things that you might think of that, that may affect brain health. So going back to the ratings, um, I wanna um, give a few examples of things that we have evaluated. And the first one is DHA, um, which is an omega-3 fatty acid that is rich in fish. Um, so the clinical trials for DHA have been a bit mixed, but some studies have shown that DHA supplements improved cognitive function in people who had a mild cognitive impairment or in people who had low levels of DHA in their system, in their blood. Um, but DHA supplements typically didn't improve cognitive function in people who had normal cognitive function. Um, also, observational studies have found that eating fish every week or um, people who have higher levels of DHA in their system had a lower risk of dementia and a slower rate of brain aging. Um, and at the ADDF for Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, we are currently funding two clinical trials to test whether DHA treatment is beneficial for people with a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's or in people who have low levels of DHA. So we will learn more when we have results from these studies. But in the meantime, um, common sources of DHA include tuna, salmon, mackerel, herring, and sardines. And one to two servings per week is recommended. 
Um, the next one I want to talk about is green tea. And green tea is one of the more promising things that we've analyzed for brain health. Um, in an observational study in Asia, green tea, um, greater green tea intake was associated with up to 27% lower risk of dementia in people who drank at least five cups a day. Um, and five cups may seem like a lot, but these studies were in Asia and I think the teacups are rather small. Um, also a randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard of medical research, um, showed that in patients who had mild cognitive impairment, green tea extract treatment for four months uh, resulted in significant improvements in memory and attention. So um, green tea uh, contains several compounds that may have beneficial properties such as caffeine, L-theanine, and green tea catechins like EGCG. Um, but if you don't like green tea, um, you know, and I, I know a lot of people drink coffee, um, there are similar benefits seen with um, drinking coffee. And so if you love coffee and you don't really like green tea, you should keep drinking coffee. Um, but for both green tea and coffee, um, I want to highlight that um, excess caffeine intake can interfere with quality sleep. And so you want to drink um, green tea or coffee earlier in the day or opt for decaffeinated versions later in the day. Um, for vitamins C and E, um, people who get high levels of vitamins C and E from their diet have up to 20 to 25% lower risk of developing dementia. However, um, supplements um, based on randomized controlled trials, supplements of these same vitamins did not offer the same protection. Um, and in fact, um, vitamin E supplements also based on um, randomized controlled trials um, were associated with a very slight but um, increased risk of mortality. Um, so it is best to get these vitamins from your diet. Um, vitamin C is rich in citrus fruits, sweet peppers and Brussels sprouts, and vitamin E is rich in leafy green vegetables, sunflower seeds, and almonds. And now um, I want to talk a little bit about a few compounds that are a little bit controversial. Resveratrol is an antioxidant found in red wine and in the skin of grapes and in some berries. Um, resveratrol um, has received a lot of hype, but a randomized controlled trial failed to show an improvement in cognitive function in Alzheimer's disease patients. So um, resveratrol treatment was not effective. Um, and in fact, resveratrol treatment was, um, at least in this clinical trial, um, associated with a greater loss of brain volume. However, the trial did show that um, resveratrol um, treatment resulted in a slower decline in the patient's ability to carry out daily tasks like getting dressed or taking a bath. Um, and I also want to note that the dose used in this clinical trial was very high. Um, you would have to drink about a thousand bottles of red wine a day to get the same dose. The next one I want to talk about is curcumin, which is a component of the spice turmeric. Um, and in two small randomized controlled trials, curcumin failed to improve cognitive functions in Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, scientifically, it is um, also a pain or a pan-assay interference compound, which can um, interfere with in vitro assays and give false positive results. So um, many of the laboratory studies that look promising, it's possible that they may not have been real. Also worth noting um, for brain health, curcumin is um, broken down very quickly and excreted. And so um, it's not very likely to reach the brain in appreciable amounts. So um, maybe um, you see the pattern here. There are lots of supplements out there, um, but when you look at the totality of evidence, um, 
it may not be as compelling as you might have thought. Um, and I want to talk about the report published by the Global Council on Brain Health in 2019, um, which was convened by the AARP. Um, the Global Council on Brain Health included diverse expertise spanning nutrition, genetics, epidemiology, neurology, internal medicine, psychiatry, public health, neuroscience, and so on. Um, Dr. Fillett, um, who was the speaker earlier today, um, the executive director and chief science officer of the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, was a member of this Global Council on Brain Health. And what they did was they looked into a vast number of supplements marketed for brain health and evaluated the evidence on whether the dietary supplements can impact people's cognitive functions. And the consensus recommendations were that the best way to get nutrients for brain health um, is from a healthy diet. And the Global Council on Brain Health does not endorse any supplement for brain health unless your healthcare provider has identified that you are deficient in a specific nutrient. And they also noted that while vitamins and minerals are essential for health um, in small doses, they could be harmful if taken in excess. Um, and with supplements or you know, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, more is not better and it's certainly not safe. Um, and multivitamins are not um, a substitute for a healthy diet. So um, here are some take-home messages. Lifestyle choices such as diet, exercise, sleep, stress management, and illness management um, have the greatest magnitudes of effects um, in protecting your brain and preventing dementia. Lifelong learning um, is associated with cognitive health and higher levels of cognitive activity later in life can delay the onset of cognitive impairment. And although there are lots and lots of supplements out there, um, there are no magic pills yet. Um, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation is funding several randomized controlled trials to test different supplements. So we will learn more when the results become available. Um, lifestyle choices have much greater impacts um, than something that comes in a capsule as we know now. And finally, um, just because a supplement shows benefit in laboratory studies, it does not mean that those benefits will translate to benefits for you. So I will stop here. Mm. Thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hara. That was fascinating. Um, really, really interesting stuff. We do have a few questions coming through. Um, so I'll start with the first one. <clears throat> Across all the different lifestyle factors, how would you prioritize what to modify target first for people who want to make a change, but may be struggling with where to start making changes? That's a great question. I think that's a great question. And there are seven, and I don't necessarily order them in the order of preference or order of priority. And um, based on the research that, you know, the, the, the research papers that I've read, um, it seems as though exercise has the greatest amount of impact. And also, you know, and this may not be helpful if you're already getting a lot of exercise, then, you know, adding to it may not have an impact. But if you don't get enough exercise, any amount of increase can substantially affect your brain health through multiple mechanisms. And I think exercise has had, um, has had the most impressive study results when I looked at you know, all sorts of lifestyle intervention studies. Great, thank you. Um, next question, what tips do you have for family members who want to motivate their loved ones to start making changes in lifestyle, but their loved ones are resistant to change? That's, yeah, that's a really um, great question as well. I think, um, you know, we all know what's healthy, but, you know, sometimes those healthy choices are not the ones that we want to take. Um, I think, you know, every bit counts. And I think, you know, 
for example, if you really don't like to exercise, you know, find something that is enjoyable, you know, even gardening can be, you know, somewhat taxing to your body, you're, you know, you're using your body, you're using your leg muscles, you know, um, lifting things. And so, you know, trying something that you can, that you like, um, that, um, you know, you can continue long term is really the most important. No one wants to, you know, you know, be on a treadmill if you don't want to be on a treadmill, you know, you, you, it's not going to last. So finding something, you know, whether, you know, if you're trying to eat healthier, you know, adding, you know, one or two items and trying different things and finding what you like, you know, if you're not into leafy green vegetables, try different leafy green vegetables. Maybe there's one that you like and, you know, add that into your diet. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the group? Give it a minute. All right. Oh, here we go. Dr. Hara, wonderful presentation. It would be great to have more such live sessions to accompany your reviews, cognitive vitality, as well as those focusing on spelling the fake news on dementia just as you've illustrated earlier. So that was just a comment. Thank oh, you. Thank yes. you so much for your nice comments. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, guys? All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hara. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, hope everyone has a great weekend. And- uh, Oh, I should advance the slide. Oh, oh, you're good. There you go. Yes. Yeah. So we do have, um, for those of you on the call, um, our next event is going to be Tuesday, September 29th at 12 PM. Um, and that's going to be with Michelle Weil and it will be a mind fit series, um, that she'll be performing. So tune in. All right. Thank you so much.